So we um, main main thing we're going to be talking about again is a growth model and how it can really help with your uh, uh, high tempo testing. So um, really the premise of high tempo testing that uh, hopefully you're all familiar with at this point is that testing is what drives growth. So um, if you do more testing, you figure out more ways to grow the business. Obviously, you want to do good testing as well. So test the right things. But um, I think so many people get caught up in in trying to test the right things that they actually don't do very much testing. And and at the end of the day, in my experience, uh, more testing is better. And um, and then this presentation is going to be about trying to focus that testing in the area where you can get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of uh, effort and focus. So um, these are just a couple of examples of companies that boosted their their tempo, their testing tempo. One of them is my direct experience with growth hackers, but uh, we'll look at Twitter first. So Twitter was uh, doing about two tests per month. And uh, in late 2010, they flattened out to almost no growth. I think they, they had a basically a completely flat quarter in late 2010. New VP of product came in, Satya Patel, and said, hey, we need to crank our testing up. He moved it from a couple of tests per month to 10 tests per week. And uh, very quickly, uh, they saw a turnaround in the growth momentum, and it, and it carried on for several uh, quarters afterwards. And uh, we all know they've kind of hit a wall recently, so I'm not sure what their testing tempo looks like now. But uh, this was very instructive of the benefit of testing. Um, Based on th this lesson and other lessons that I saw, I, I did something similar at Growth Hackers where um, we, we got pretty quickly to about 90,000 monthly active users, and then we hit a wall. We plateaued for a few months where we, uh, where we saw no growth in the business, and I kept saying to the team, hey, team, we need to do more testing, but I wasn't specific about it, and so you know, if, if, if we're running one or two tests a month and then somebody moves it to three tests, they feel like, okay, good, we're doing more testing, but that's really not enough to move the needle. So I finally got specific about it and said, we need to do three tests per week. And any week where we don't run three tests is a week that we fail on the inputs that drive growth. And any week that we do three tests, we know we did what we needed to do to drive growth and hopefully growth will follow, but uh, let's focus on the inputs. And as soon as we move to three tests per week, we saw a very steep uh, improvement in the growth trajectory. And so um, testing drives growth, but what's really important is that uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're super systematic and process oriented as we're doing that testing. And so a high tempo testing process looks something like this. This is, this is a similar process to what uh, Facebook uses and Uber uses. And a lot of different companies have, have something that looks like this and, uh, and it's, and it's really, it makes sense. It's really about kind of analyzing the situation, figuring out where you have opportunities for growth, trying to generate lots of ideas in those areas, prioritizing those ideas to see which ones you're going to run week to week, then actually doing the testing against those ideas, analyzing the results, updating your analysis of, of the situation and the latest learning from your tests, generating more ideas, and just repeating that process over and over is what a high tempo testing process looks like. Um, today, we're going to focus a lot on the analysis and how a growth model fits into that analysis. So uh, the first thing that you want to start with with your analysis is establishing your North Star metric. And uh, by the way, just to, uh, for anyone who may be wondering, um, there's going to be a lot of time for questions at the end. So I, I expect to, to have at least a half hour of, of questions. So I should be able to get through the slides by, uh, by about the half hour point, And then uh, we'll have another half hour for questions. So I'll go through them relatively quickly, and then we'll, we'll get all the questions in at once. But uh, so for analysis, the first thing that you want to do is really establish your North Star metric. Because if you don't, if you don't have a clear North Star metric, then what looks like growth to one person on your team might uh, might not seem like growth to someone else on your team. So an example would be uh, registrations. Um, what is is a registration a good number? Uh, having a lot of registrations is that a good thing? It can be, um, but if those registered users or registered people never actually use the product, then it's kind of pointless and kind of worthless. So um, what you want to do is establish a North Star metric that is really correlated to the, to the value that your product delivers. So um, much better than something like, a, like a registrations would be um, people who actually become active users. Or um, you know, in the case of Facebook, what they, what they look at is their 
daily active user number. And what's good about looking at a daily active user number is that that's also uh, considering anyone who stopped using. So if I'm bringing in 100 new users a day and the 100 people I brought in yesterday stop using, then I'm not having any growth. I'm just having replacement. So a daily active user number is going to consider churn. Uh, for, for SaaS businesses, MRR is the same kind of thing. It's going to consider churn. So it's, it's really kind of the cumulative value that you're delivering on a daily or you might in your business, it might be more appropriate to use weekly active users. Companies like Airbnb, uh, Uber has a similar number to this uh, that, that are, are basically focused on the transactions. So Airbnb would be nights booked. Uber is rides taken, but that's it's it's a reflection of value delivered in the service, and um, and it provides a really good lens for measuring the sustainable growth. So establish a north star metric is really important, and once you've established a north star metric, then you can start to think about the variables that work together to move that north star metric, and that's really what a growth model is. So um, for I think a, a really kind of common framework to look at is uh, Dave McClure's Pirate Metrics R framework, and it, and this is pretty good for most businesses. So basically, um, most of the variables can fall within things like acquisition, activation, retention, and referral. I personally like to look at it almost as a as a flow chart of value delivery. So that's what this next slide kind of shows a growth model that basically takes that funnel, takes the referral loop, and how does that all work together to drive revenue? So um, acquisition, it's pretty clear. What are the key referring channels? You want to have some context around, you know, the intent of users. Are you, are you generating demand or are you harvesting demand? So if people are already Googling for solutions like yours, you would be harvesting demand. If you have to run radio ads or banner ads just to bring attention to your category of products and why your category, uh, why your product is the best within the category, then you're in demand uh, creation mode. But uh, anyway, you want to break down what are your key acquisition sources, top of funnel, and then for activation, what is, uh, what is the aha moment? I'm going to go into some specific detail and I'll actually use a, a case study of, of my own focus in our own business uh, these days and, and what we're activation is something we're really focused on. And, uh, and I like to think of the aha moment as the, as the key point of activation. So I'll go into more detail on what I mean by that. And then retention is really around the core benefit. What is that core benefit that brings people back on a regular basis to, to, uh, to keep using the product referral is something I hear a lot of companies say we we don't really have a referral loop in our business, but generally, if I can spend you know 15 or 20 minutes talking with them and understanding their business, I can usually help to uncover a referral loop. So just kind of do a do a deep thought and kind of think about you know before your solution, how did how did uh, certain things what you know what was the alternative solution before and how how did word spread among that alternative solution? And a lot of times you'll you'll be able to figure out a referral loop that way, and then generally this machine of, of all of these levers, how do these things work together to move your North Star metric? So it's pretty abstract when you look at it this way. So I'm gonna actually show you a specific example, which is LinkedIn and um, something that we're all familiar with. Uh, they've got a pretty good international presence. So I'm assuming most of you have seen LinkedIn and this isn't something that LinkedIn published, but there's enough information. And just through observing LinkedIn, I could put together something that I think fairly well reflects LinkedIn, but, uh, but again, it's not something that they've necessarily published this way. So I'm very confident on the acquisition channels for LinkedIn. So SEO is, is really big for them. So anytime somebody creates a new profile, that's going to get picked up by Google or Bing. And that profile then will, uh, will be, be picked up and drive a lot of new acquisitions. So somebody who searches for that name, they're going to then see essentially their resume and they're going to come in and be able to, to uh, be exposed to LinkedIn and, and possibly sign up from that. Uh, international expansion is a really big part of their uh, top of funnel growth. And so um, that's why I'm pretty confident that uh, most of our international audience here will have seen uh, seen LinkedIn or, or be familiar with it. And then, of course, invites are a huge part of LinkedIn. So anytime I create a profile and 
uh, see a list of other people who I know who have profiles. I'm going to I'm going to be generating more connections with them, and then LinkedIn also does a uh, a, a scrape of the um, of the email uh, address book of your email address book if you if you allow them to. And when they do that, they show all of your contacts who you could potentially invite in one swoop. Um, they've, they've changed it kind of a little bit over time, but that was a big part of their growth in the beginning. And, um, and so some of those contacts are already going to be on LinkedIn. Others are going to then be invited for the first time exposure to LinkedIn. But basically, all of that top of funnel doesn't really matter until they get to that aha moment. And what I think the aha moment for LinkedIn is, uh, is essentially um, once they've created a profile and seen some people that they know, they connect with those people. Now you've kind of got this aha moment like, OK, I, I get that. It's, it's a way I'm going to be able to stay connected with these people and keep them updated as my resume essentially evolves. And then every time that you add new people uh, through invites, if you meet people and send them an invite, you're driving that referral loop. And then all of this works together to improve the total number of uh, profiles, connections. And, uh, and that's really what I think their North Star metric is. And the reason why I, I put revenue on there is that the more profiles – that most of their revenue is coming from uh, coming from uh, uh, recruiting agencies, and so as those recruiting uh, recruiters, whether it's an agency or an in, internal recruiter, is now looking through lots of profiles to find the right fit for a position. The more profiles, the more revenue they're going to be able to generate, and so that's how the LinkedIn kind of overall model works together. So I, I mentioned that the aha moment is a really important moment, and um, so I just want to go into a little bit of detail on what that is. Um, I'm going to actually pause for one second and take a look. I've, I've purposely not looked at the uh, discussion going on because I um, it, would, it would be pretty distracting. So I'm going to take a look real quick and see if there's any uh, questions that have, have come up in here. No. Okay. So good, because we're going to try to do the questions here at the end. So, um, all right. So your aha moment is really important, and that's what we're focused on. At my company right now, and so I'll go into details on what we're doing uh, to, to to improve uh, the number of people who hit the aha moment. I'll go into those details in a minute, but um, for for a description of what the aha moment is, it's really that first taste of what the core benefit of your product is. So it's something. It's the first time that they actually get some benefit from your product, or at least an indication of what the benefit's going to be. If they don't get to that point on a first visit the likelihood that they're ever going to come back again is super low. Why would you come back to something that gave you no benefit? So what you want to do is really be focused on when I get somebody to my website, a prospect to my website for the first time or to my app for the first time, I want to make sure that I give them some benefit and that I focus all of my onboarding to get them to that, to, to a benefit that's achievable on that first visit, or I'm never going to see them again. So figure out your aha moment. It's, we had a lot of debate internally to try to figure out what our aha moment is. Um, and there, there's probably more than one potential aha moment that you can use, but you, uh, sometimes this is referred to as a magic moment as well, but it's a, it's a really important part of your growth model. And so take the time to figure out something that, that works for your business. So here's what a kind of a simplified version of what our growth model for, for growth hackers looks like. And um, so I'll take you through each of these. Uh, the aha moment in our case is something that we spent a lot of time debating. And for us, we believe it's sharing a great idea. And, you know, so a lot of you are probably going to be familiar mostly with the community for growth hackers. But when we are talking about growth hackers, we're thinking about the, uh, both the community and our workflow product is, which is where we generate our revenue. So um, it's, this is kind of the intersection. Most people come to growth hackers for inspiration of ideas to test and ways to grow their business. So once they've captured an idea in our growth hackers projects and have shared that idea, they're much more likely to come back and use the product. And we've got data that supports that, that shows that if they don't achieve that in the, in the first visit, once they've gone into projects, um, then they're much less likely to come back in and use projects again. But if they can achieve that in the first visit, then they're significantly more likely to come back and, and use it again. So um, 
for looking at top of funnel, our uh, key channels are Twitter, not surprisingly. Um, we've got a really big Twitter following and we're pushing content out there a lot. So a lot of people come into Growth Hackers via Twitter. SlideShare has been good. Just like, for example, these slides that I'm going through now, you'll see on the last slide, I actually have a promotion for our uh, Growth Hackers projects. And uh, the, the minute that I started adding that to my last slide, our growth rate for projects doubled. So SlideShare is a really important uh, channel for us. And then invites within our system. When somebody sets up a collaborative testing environment and starts to invite additional people from their company or even advisors and agencies, those invites are, are a big part of our overall expansion. But again, we know that just because someone enters the top of the funnel, if they don't get to some kind of experience where they've found a great idea and ideally shared that great idea, they're, um, they're unlikely to come back and keep using the service. So sharing a great idea is, is our, our goal for that initial visit. And then the ongoing benefit is uh, having unique growth insights from testing in their business. So we want to make sure that uh, over time, people are generating insights uh, for how to grow their business. They're generating those insights via testing. And um, the more insights they have, the more likely they're going to uh, be retained and stick within the service. I've already talked about how invites work. And then the North Star metric for us, and we had, again, a lot of debate and long discussions on this, is card hops and card hops the reason we picked that as a north star metric and i'll, I'll show you what that means in a minute I'll, I'll show you what the product looks like um but card hops essentially is a reflection of the testing velocity that uh that our customers have and if they don't have much testing velocity then they're not getting value from our product and just as you remember from the initial slide testing drives growth then they're not they're not uh our mission is to help people test more and run better tests. So they're not running tests. They're not using our product. They're not getting value. They're unlikely to keep generating revenue. So card hops for us is everything from an initial idea being captured within the system. And then that idea going from uh, prioritizing the, it as a test and then eventually moving it into a knowledge base where you have the results attached to that test. Each one of those counts as a card hop. And the more hops we have in our system, the more that we're moving uh, that kind of sustainable growth metric that uh, reflects revenue and reflects user value. So um, when we look at all of this information, our big focus right now, we realize that sharing a great idea is is where we have the most leverage within our model. What we've found is that uh, I think it's 89% of the people who, who come in and actually are able to use Growth Hackers projects, like come in and see Growth Hackers projects or get through the full signup process, get dropped into the product, 89% of those people do not get to our aha moment. And so what that means is if they, don't, if they don't get to the point where they've added ideas and, and invited other people into their collaboration environment, they're very unlikely to generate the growth insights and, uh, and the card hops to stay within the system. And so when we analyzed all the numbers around the entire growth model, it was clear that this is where we should focus. Because if we have, if we have a poor conversion to the aha moment, poor conversion to activation, then it's kind of a waste of time to even focus on the invites because most of those invites are not going to be are not going to be getting value uh, from the product and uh, and as well as top of funnel. So one of the things we we looked at um, we've been actually uh, submitted to Product Hunt two or three times now, and each time we go and we beg them to take us down from Product Hunt because we know that with our bad conversion rate to the aha moment it's going to be just a waste to, to put us on product hunt until we can improve that. So here's what our plan actually looks like. I hope this isn't too small for people to be able to read there, but, um, but basically uh, we have a relatively recent start date. So uh, today's the 13th. So only three days ago was the start date on this uh, campaign, this growth objective. We gave ourselves 30 days to move that 11% actually to the goal of 35%. And so um, that's a 218% lift, basically a, a tripling of the conversion rate 
Um, and uh, what we basically, by focusing on this, now everyone on the team knows they need to generate ideas that are related to improving the aha moment, improving the activation rate. And um, it's already started to help us generate a lot more ideas. And we're doing a lot of research to figure out why people are uh, are not getting to what we consider an activated moment. So this little pie chart, for example, I didn't put the specific uh, information. This is a last minute um, addition to the slides. Um, this is just a breakdown of uh, the area where we're focused on for this growth objective is um, are people who signed up, uh, came in, saw the product, but never got to the point where they had two ideas and two uh, at least two people and at least two ideas in their project. And so we figured out that there's four states of people there. And the biggest group within there are people who have not even added a single idea. And so part of our research, one, we just wanted to segment and break down. So that's, that's really when you're trying to figure out uh, core, core kind of bottlenecks within your growth model, segmenting and, and then both qualitative and or quantitative segmenting and then qualitative assessment of why that segment's not taking the action you want is really important. So today, in fact, we're launching a Qualaroo survey that asks everybody who lands in on the ideas page within our product, why they, it asks them, are they ready to, uh, to add an idea to Growth Hackers projects. And if they select no, it asks, please, please explain why you're not ready to add an idea. And that insight then will, will drive a lot, of, uh, a lot of solutions that we can test to improve the number of people who add, add an idea. So what we know from doing this research is that the add the idea is the, is the bigger issue. This group here is actually people who did add an idea, but they didn't invite anybody. But we also know that we, among this group, that at least half the ideas that are being added are not uh, are not real ideas. They're just kind of like test ideas, just kind of kicking the tires on the product, as opposed to truly trying to capture a great idea that then they want to share with someone else. So our goal in only a 30-day period is to move it from 11% of the people who are activated to 35%. And it's that's still, in my experience, relatively low on a 35% to get to the aha moment. My experience, usually I can get about 50% of the people to an aha moment, but this is time capped where this is in only a 30 day period. And what that means is that if we can achieve this, it means that essentially every, every effort that we have in acquisition or in, in improving invites is going to be three times more effective. So that's why we're focused on this area first. So hopefully that makes sense for everyone. And uh, and then that's when we start generating the ideas in that area. So I'll go through relatively quickly to kind of show you. Um, you'll see some screenshots from Growth Hackers projects, but it's really I think it helps to explain the uh, case a little bit. So um, we've highlighted to the team that activation is our focus area. And so what you can see, we color code the ideas and you can see just of the last eight ideas, six of those last eight ideas are color coded activation ideas and we are really focused against this objective. Uh, each idea, it's really important when you're building your ideas, um, and you can do this in, in spreadsheets or Trello or other places. Uh, Growth Hackers Projects isn't the only place to do it. Um, the, the more important part is the, is the process to follow. Um, we think Growth Hackers Projects is, is the best way to do it, but we're gonna be biased, of course. So as you're building out an experiment doc, um, some of the key things you're going to want to think about are a clear hypothesis. When we run this, we believe this result will happen, and this is why we believe that result will happen. Uh, any research that you can uh, attach to the experiment, again, like I talked about, like the Qualaroo research that we're, that we're running on trying to figure out why people are not taking the desired action, that's great research to attach to this. Um, and then the target lever. So uh, activation is the target lever here. And, um, and then just any, any screenshots or descriptions or anything attached to, to this idea that will help, uh, help you categorize the idea. And then ice scoring is another really important part. So um, pretty straightforward on what ice scoring is, but I'm sure some of you aren't familiar with it. So you're basically looking at the idea from uh, impact 
perspective, a confidence perspective, and an ease perspective. So impact meaning if this works, is it game changing for the business or is it just going to be kind of an incremental benefit to the business? Um, if it's game changing, you'd give it a 10. If it's something that um, just just going to probably move the needle a little bit, then you might give it only a, a two or a three um, and or even a one if it's really not going to move it much. But Rarely do I see ideas that are only have a one for impact. Uh, confidence means, do I have a lot of research? Is this a typical best practice? Um, what, how, how likely is this idea to work? And then ease, um, is, is this something we can test really easily or is it something that's going to require a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, time and, and work and effort to, to test this idea? So the best ideas are going to be really high impact. You're going to have a lot of evidence that it can work and it's going to be really easy to test. And um, if you, if you have an idea that scores tens all across uh, and it's in your focus area, then that's likely a really good idea to run. Um, and so that you can use that information for the prioritization. So with uh, growth hackers projects, you would basically uh, filter down to just activation ideas. Um, you, you can look at it in kind of a card view or in a line view. The nice thing with line view, it makes it easier to compare. So you would narrow down to activation ideas, and then you could sort by overall score or by, you know, this one here is sorted by ease. Um, but uh, if you want to just say, let's just focus on really high impact ideas. We've got a lot of uh, excess development capacity right now. Let's, uh, let's not worry about how easy they are. Let's focus on the impact ones. Then you could potentially sort by impact. But once you have things like filters and, uh, and the ice score, um, and then even kind of more narrow tags where you might say, uh, I'm, I just want to look, if you were like an acquisition, I just want to consider uh, Facebook experiment, experiments, then you would be able to kind of go into some of the tags around that as well. So the way we work on our team is that we actually, each person does all of that filtering and selection themselves who's on our core growth team and then nominates those ideas uh, for consideration for that week. And each person can only nominate two ideas per week. So every, everyone on the growth team, me as CEO can only do two and uh, anyone else can only do two. And then we do basically in our weekly growth meeting, I'll show you an agenda that we use for our weekly growth meeting, but we basically each spend a minute or two just pitching the ideas that we think are worth running that week. And, um, and then we make a quick decision at the end. What are the, uh, uh, generally for us, it's about three to five ideas that we, we actually want to test that week. And by the time each person's done their pitching, um, then there's, then usually we've, uh, usually it's, it's easy to select which ones we want to run. And that's when we actually do the testing. And, um, basically we would send it to the up next column. This up next column, we assign it to a project manager. That project manager uh, is responsible for uh, getting that test live. If it doesn't go live at, at the next week's growth meeting, they, you have one person who can answer the question of why that didn't go live. So was it uh, we couldn't get access to a designer or uh, the, the tracking wasn't in place yet, whatever it might be. Um, it's, uh, it's something that you, it, it helps to have a single person responsible for getting it live. Ideally, that person's actually going to be really passionate about the idea. Um, if they're, if they're just going through the motions on the implementation, that's unlikely to work, but if they're excited and they, they are a champion of the idea and they're implementing it, then they might just add just the finishing touches to it that make it more likely to be successful. Once they have it live, they drag it to the active column. So everyone on the team can see what are the live tests and, uh, and then once it's got a representative sample size run long enough, then it would go into the ready to analyze column. Um, it's important to uh, integrate all of your testing systems together. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're using Optimizely, um, you want to make sure that you're cross-referencing the Optimizely experiment on your experiment doc. Uh, with Growth Hackers Projects, it actually links directly and pulls the information in. But if you're using spreadsheets, then you just want to make sure that you're, you're cross-referencing things really well. And then, uh, and then the final step is to analyze and uh, you want to break down kind of the key lesson learned. What was the result? Um, what's here on the screen is something that uh, one of my friends, Tammy Camp from the 500 startups team uh, had suggested to us that we start using uh, DKIM for our emails. She said that would help our open rate. She suggested that it uh, would 
probably give us, her hypothesis was that it would give us a 10% improvement in our open rate. Um, when we ran the test, it actually gave us a 12.5% improvement. So she was able to then see those results. And then we've got all of that information captured in the knowledge base so that if someone else comes up with the idea of DKIM in the future, they'll be able to see we've already run that test. It already worked or we've already run that test and it didn't work. So um, as you start to run more and more weekly tests, it becomes really important to make sure that uh, you've, you're well organized on the information around those tests. So um, for us, we're, we basically have, it's all organized by tags. We can drill down into our Twitter tests, our email tests, uh, tests around our conference, whatever, whatever it might be, and see, uh, see which ones worked and which ones didn't work and kind of know our hit rate by channel as well. So the more that you can get those organized, the better. And, uh, and then you just keep repeating that process. And, and I, again, ideally using your growth model, you are building uh, kind of one month campaign. Sometimes people use three month campaigns, but a, a focus area where you're being very deliberate around what is our baseline metric? What are we trying to move it to? Let's get as many test ideas within that area. Of course, you can generate test ideas that are outside that area, but the ones that you select week to week should really be uh, in, in that test area. So, um, and then you wanna just monitor what your key testing inputs are. So how many ideas are you generating per week? How many tests do you get activated? Um, how many tests get completed? How many were winners? How many were losers? But just the more that you can monitor that information, the more that you can hold yourself accountable for the inputs that actually drive growth. And if you're not, if you're not measuring the inputs and you're only focused on the output of growth, you're going to probably be pretty disappointed because just focusing on the output is not going to affect the output. You have to think about how, how do the things that I do affect that output and measure your testing velocity is one of the most important ways you can do that. Uh, and I, I promise I'd show you a quick look at what our weekly growth uh, meeting agenda looks like. So um, this is, again, I'm going to make these slides available, but uh, just kind of we, we really try to time box it to an hour so that we can get uh, key people to take the time each week to come and attend and get our best brains in the company thinking about growth and, and what we should be focused on and getting the buy-in from the people who will actually be doing the implementation for experiments. And, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what I put at the end of all of my growth hackers uh, presentations is a promotion for our uh, growth hackers projects uh, product. Um, it's available for a free trial. There's the link projects.growthhackers.com. But as soon as I added that to the end of all of my slide shares, we got a doubling of sign up. So it's, that's a top of funnel thing. Um, but again, just doubling the signups does not, in our case, lead to more usage. So that's why we're super focused on the activation step right now. So that's it for the slides. So I'm going to open it up for some questions. And uh, the chat is the best way to, best way to enter questions. So um, I will uh, take a look down there now. And... Um, Please just plug them into uh, into your um, chat box there if you have some questions. Uh, so you can Google DKIM. Someone's asking what is DKIM. It's a, I think it's an authentication key, um, but it, it's basically, it just helps with the deliverability. I didn't know what it meant, which was part of the reason why I asked her to enter it in. Um, so here, how do we, hopefully I can pause this thing. All right, there we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, how do we deal with the aha moment with a service that is more of an investment base, meaning on the first visit, you take action to invest. Uh, you then see results on your second business visit. What does this mean for the aha moment? So this is, that's why, that's why the aha moment is so important. It's really hard in some businesses. If you, if you actually think about it, projects is a Projects is, a, uh, is an investment business as well. You're generating an idea and you, it's a long time till you see if that idea worked or not. And so um, that's, that's why we had to kind of break out, like just coming in and seeing the product is not going to get them to an aha. But so in our case, it's, a, it's an experiment idea. Your business, it might be just an investment idea. What you need to do is just give them at least one good investment idea on that initial visit. And then they're, 
and, and help them capture that idea. And it, as long as they've done that, they're much more likely to come back and want to actually, uh, actually try that investment or, or build out some of their other investment ideas and start to put together their portfolio. So again, this is a, just off the cuff, but um, that's what you just need to think about. What is, what is an achievable taste of the aha moment that, uh, or t- taste of the core benefit that you can deliver on an initial visit? So hopefully that answers your question, John. So um, Adrian, I see, did did uh, en- enter some details around what DKIM is. So um, thank you for doing that for anyone who didn't like my explanation. Um, how does someone, the, somebody without a data scientist identify the aha moment? Uh, can you fudge it? So um, Joe, I, I think the important part is you don't necessarily need a data scientist um, out of the gate for your aha moment. I think what you um, what you need start with a hypothesis and um, and you, you just need to kind of just think about it. Like I, I can tell you an example at Log Me In, we had um, we we had a ton of people signing up for Log Me In, and um, I think again the beginning probably within the first few weeks of, of launching it, we had a thousand people a day signing up for it. But when I dug into the numbers, I could see that um, only, only about uh, 3% were actually ever doing a remote control session. And so um, I could tell myself, like, did, did any of those people ever get value from the product? The answer is likely no. So in the case of Log Me In, the, the question was, could we get them to a remote control session on an initial visit, and um, and and that's kind of a hard a hard one because you you need to go to a different computer to actually do your first remote control session. Um, but uh, but but potentially you could or you could uh, sim or simulate a remote control session. So I don't remember exactly what we did for that aha moment, but it was you know ultimately it was that realization that clearly just signing up for the service was not an aha moment. And so I would just, I would start by just really, really qualitatively thinking about when is somebody getting value? Another thing that you can do is um, I've gotten a lot of benefit from actually recorded user testing videos. So like uh, usertesting.com is a good place to start and actually have people, ideally your target customers come in, and try the product and watch those recordings and give them a set of things to do, but watch those recordings. And I've, I've actually seen people say, Oh, I get it. Oh, wow. This is really cool. And, and a lot of times you see them doing that when they're performing the same action. So, you know, once, once you've seen that, then, then you start to know uh, that, that there's some, some light bulb goes off at that moment. And that's likely what your aha moment is. And again, there's not just one aha moment in a business. There may be, two or three, but you, you can, you just want to focus, you want to find the one that uh, you can rally the team around to, to try to get people to on an initial visit. All right. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, how do you deal with an aha moment when you sell home cooked meals? Um, you know, again, home cooked meals, um, you know, it, it might be, it might be something that, uh, you you end up giving them a recipe, and the, the truth is that you that somebody could cook something uh, on on an initial visit. It's 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 unlikely that it's going to happen very often, but uh, but you know just trying to narrow it down to you know and and, and like I, I one thing I saw yesterday for example um, I'm not again I don't know your business too much, but I I saw somebody had, it was actually Drew uh, Houston from. Uh, Dropbox posted something on Facebook where he said a uh, Chobani yogurt has more sugar than a uh, than than a uh, bowl of ice cream. And what are what kind of bad stuff are we putting in our bodies? And so, you know, like there was an aha moment for me just in that one little image. And so, you know, in, in your case, it might might be kind of just nutrition facts or or something that you can get them to that's related to what your key service is, but um, but you delivered something of value rather than just they filled out a form. Um, again, without kind of going deep into your business, that, that that may or may not make sense. So, a question here about North Star metrics. Let me take a look real quick at that. Uh, 
identifying your North Star metric is straightforward enough, but how can we identify the best time frame for that metric? Uh, Airbnb bookings per night, per day, uh, do fluctuations in usage due to holidays uh, necessarily require us to consider our average? Uh, so this, uh, I think what's interesting with this question, James, is that um, I, I had somebody the other day suggest to me that their North Star metric was uh, – was uh, net promoter score, or they were trying to use net promoter score for their North Star metric. And um, the problem with net promoter score, and and again, the reason I'm saying is because you're talking about average here. The problem with net promoter score is that uh, you you could have zero growth and have a great net promoter score. And so net promoter score is not a reflection of of the increase in overall impact of your business. And so that, to me, your North Star metric should be, really be tied to uh, the, the impact that your business was making. And so Airbnb, it's not average bookings per night, it's nights booked. And so, you know, it, it's, it's essentially kind of taking, taking a, an overall curve that, that just shows, you know, that if, if they booked last month, a million nights and that this month they're at, at uh, they're on track to do 1.5 million nights and next month they'll be on track to do 2 million nights. You've got this nice curve, but that it's really tied to the value that the customers are getting and the impact that they're making as a business. And so seasonality might slow that down a little bit. Um, but then, then they have the explanation from seasonality with that, but it, it should really be more of a growth curve number that reflects the, the overall impact in the business. And so that's where average doesn't necessarily uh, work well there. So ho- hopefully that gives you a little more clarification. Uh, question from Masha. Um, let's see. How do you guys link business metrics to projects? As an example, if your activation rate is what you're trying to move, What's the metric you want to be uh, staring at in projects? Uh, at least that's what we'd like, which normally heap into GA. So, um, so uh, like business metrics in projects, like uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm interpreting your question right, Masha. But, um, but ultimately, like if, if you take that activation metric that I mentioned. Um, that somebody needs to have a great idea captured and ideally share that idea. And that's an activation for us in projects. Is that, is that a business metric? Not necessarily, but it's a gateway to a business metric. There's no way that someone's going to become a ongoing paying customer if they never have a great idea and they can never test that great idea if they never add that great idea. And that they, they're more likely to add more great ideas I'm more likely to test those ideas if we've got more people participating. So if they've shared with more people in projects. And so the business metrics are further down the funnel, but these are gateways to, to achieving something that's going to move a business metric. So um, I, I do think your North star metrics should be tightly correlated with your, with your business metrics and that your aha moment should be tightly correlated with getting people to, the ongoing benefit, which is going to be correlated to your North Star metric. So they all do tie together, but um, hope, hopefully um, hopefully that makes sense. And again, I'm just sort of uh, shooting from the cuff and hopefully understanding what you're asking there. I um, uh, have another question. So it's, this is a private one. So I'm not sure if I'm supposed to read that out, out loud, but from, from Max here, um, asking about activation for a hardware startup. Um, without a real product. Um, so I'm guessing that you mean that you don't yet have the product. Um, it's still in development, but how can you, so you, what you have written here at, at, at the stage of acquisition for testing price and features. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think that that's, that's kind of a hard question. Like pre launch, there's, there's not, there's not a ton that you can do to to really kind of uh, optimize your growth model you can do a little bit so you you can for example test some of your acquisition channels and um and see if 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 you can generate some demand from those acquisition channels um but the further you go down into the funnel the harder it is to actually 
validate that the um, that the product is like is delivering on an aha moment or an ongoing benefit um, just until you actually have that product. So um, I, I I would say for right now it's great to to kind of have a hypothesis driven uh, growth model, but um, but know that you're not going to be able to really uh, optimize or or refine that growth model until until you're until you're actually executing the business until the business is ready so ho- hopefully that's helpful for you um, I would I would focus maybe on a little bit of demand validation up front um, but uh, you know beyond that it's gonna it's gonna be pretty tough um, but maybe I'm just not being creative enough so if you think of something let me know um, so uh, a question here I'm not even gonna try to pronounce your name uh, Starts with you. <laughs> um, how do you rally the team uh, members to be on the same page uh, towards the aha moment, especially when team members have additional commitments? Um, so, I, I think what I've found is is having a just a growth model in general is a great way to start to rally the team around it because once you've what you find if you don't have actually a, a mapped out visualization of your growth model, what you may find is that there's some uh, disconnects that people are not actually um, are not actually aware that they're on different pages. And so the minute that you've actually wrote down what your assumptions are around what your growth model looks like, then you can start to debate. Um, and, and what I've done is is I've done it both in my uh, both in my growth meetings and then again in my executive meetings where I literally say, does anybody disagree that this is the aha moment? And um, it's actually been in my executive meetings where, where I think we've made some of our better refinements that the growth team sometimes just gets a little too caught up in the day-to-day execution where um, the executive team, like our North Star metric, um, we, that, that came from our VP of engineering. He, he kind of looked at all the data and said, I think our North Star metric should be this. And our um, aha moment came from our head of customer success. Um, again, these were like slight refinements on what we had there already. But um, so I, I think that's, that's how you get people on the same page. Even if they've got additional commitments outside, it's, it's about kind of getting them into the room and then just debating some of the things and knowing that there's no perfect answer for any of these things. So it's, it's a matter of kind of coming up with the best that you can and then constantly thinking, is there, is there something that's even better representative as our aha moment? And your aha moment in the beginning is really just a hypothesis. And then over time, you're going to find is, is that truly correlated with long-term customer retention? If it's not, then it's probably the wrong aha moment. So um, over time, you can use the data to, to inform if you made the right choice. But in the beginning, it's probably more hypothesis driven. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, there's one from Jesse. So how should you look at an aha moment uh, for a team based SaaS company uh, to drive from trial to conversion. We want our lead user to experience the aha moment because they are buying, but we have different aha moments for the team members they bring along. So that, that would be similar to what we have with growth hackers projects. And um, I, for us, we're, we're directly focused really on, on the initial, what you're calling a lead user. So Right now, we're initially focused on that lead user, but you want to uh, you want to actually, you know, map out that user journey for um, for invited users, collaborators, and and other people as well. And you're going to have to think through. Maybe it's the same aha moment, or maybe it's different for these for these other groups. Um, so, like in the case of Dropbox, was was kind of more complicated than. Uh, than a lot of products because um, Dropbox was a lot of different products depending on how you were introduced to it. So um, if you came through the homepage, a lot of times your expectation was that it was primarily a product to keep your data synchronized between multiple devices. But a lot of people came through a specific file that was being shared. And so for them, it was really this file sharing service. And, um, and so we needed to we needed to introduce the product to those people um, from the context of a file sharing service. And then there's a whole nother group who were coming in as uh, you know, into a shared folder where there's multiple 
uh, files within that folder. And those people, again, had had a different expectation of what the service was going to be. And so we had to optimize that pathway, again, with a different aha moment. And, and then ultimately, the the final destination for all of these people to the to the must have benefit was something that uh, we wanted them to have a holistic understanding of the solution. But um, again, depending on the path they were coming in, we had we had different aha moments for them, and we optimized those paths separately. But what we did know was that for those people who understood that it actually is great for folder. Uh, collaboration, great for sharing individual files and great for keeping your files synchronized between all of your devices and even backed up would be kind of a fourth use case. Once somebody got their head around all of those things, we had them locked in forever. And so, um, so it's really a question of when do you introduce them to that holistic benefit? And if, if we do it too early, we were going to kind of hit them with too much complexity and they were likely to bounce out. So we had to really focus on that aha moment, get them micro converted before we get them kind of macro converted. So ho- hopefully that, that uh, is helpful for you as you think about um, aha moments in your business. Um, okay. I got a question here from Martin. Uh, what are some of the most important metrics uh, you guys are tracking for projects? Do you have a North star? Uh, do you guys constantly reevaluate top level metrics and change them as your product life cycle changes? Um, so I went into a, a bit of that, Martin. Um, so our North Star metric, as I, as I talked about in the slides, is the, um, is the card hops. And, um, and yeah, I mean, a lot, we're, we're still relative. We just came out of private beta about a month and a half or less than a month and a half ago. So, um, you know, a lot of it is kind of hypothesis driven and with some data behind it, but, um, but I expect that we'll make lots of changes as, as we start to see where the actual correlations between actions are in onboarding. And, um, but it, but we also, we were in private beta for a year and a half. So um, we have had lots of data to kind of inform these decisions um, over time. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the mentality of, of any good growth hacker or growth marketer, whatever you want to call it um, is that, you're constantly in that uh, there's got to be a better way mode. There's there's I, I, I am I creative enough to figure out the better way and then to use data to validate that it is in fact a better way. And so um, that includes your approach, your model, and then each of your individual tactics and your and your programs to improve conversions throughout that you're, you're constantly in this. There's got to be a better way mode. So um, I, I would definitely apply that to the growth model as well. Um, all right, let's, uh, we're coming up on just like three more minutes. So um, I will take a, just a couple of more questions here. So that one looks long, so I'll jump to this one. Uh, do you recommend running several tests at the same time or should you only run them one by one uh, to not cross contaminate test results? Um, so that Lewis, that's a good question. I think uh, the, uh, some of the, best stuff that I've seen on, uh, on kind of testing, uh, on, on doing testing in the right way comes from uh, the conversion Excel blog. So I'd, I'd recommend that you take a look at that. Um, but, and the main thing is that it, it really depends on the test. So top of funnel tests, you can run lots of acquisition tests at the same time. And, uh, but you definitely don't want to be running, um, multiple tests on the same page in your conversion uh, process at the same time. So, so that you, you can run them uh, at, at different steps. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's really a, you know, it depends and it's a pretty long answer, but conversion Excel writes some, some great stuff on, on proper testing procedures. So I, I recommend you take a look at that blog. Uh, Steve's asking how much is projects per month. So it's $125 per month. Um, that is for unlimited users right now that, that uh, it normally would only cover up to five users, but um, we're allowing unlimited users for 125 up until the end of September. And then it's uh, $25 per user after your initial five uh, following September. Uh, what's typical North Star metric for subscription-based uh, services? Um, I, 
I think MRR can be a really good one for a subscription-based service, so monthly recurring revenue. Again, the, the benefit of MRR is, uh, is that it does take churn into account. So um, if, you're, if you're continuing to, if you have you know, 10 or 15% month over month MRR growth, then that means that net of churn, you're, you've, got, you've got a really good growth rate. If you, um, and, and churn is often going to be a reflection of uh, lack of core value from, from people or, or it's just the type of business that you have. Like um, if, if, you, if you have a dating site that's a subscription-based dating site, then maybe, maybe they actually found a spouse and so they, they churned out. But um, it, yeah, it kind of de- depends on the business, but um, hopefully, hopefully that is helpful for you from an MRR perspective. I, I would just, you know, just make sure that you look at what's unique about your business and, and uh, make sure that applies. Um, I'm going to do last, uh, last question here since we just hit the hour mark. 10 o'clock here on uh, in California time, uh, Pacific time. So uh, uh, let's see, we've got, I'll, I'll do another one from Martin here. So uh, you guys set the default weekly tempo goal for projects uh, for three experiments a week. Do you think everybody should be testing at least three uh, things per week? How do you f- define high tempo testing and how do you increase the tempo? So um, I think three is a good is a good number. I mean, the benefit that like a lot of people will say that we can't do three because uh, because we just don't have the resources to do three. But, you know, if you're if you, you if you think like you, you could do a headline test on a page using Optimizely, for example, that takes like five minutes to do and everybody has the capacity to do a test like that. Um, and it's surprising that, you know, that, that basically every every page on your website should probably have an AB test running on it at, at the same time, like to, to some degree, um, you know, as long as they don't kind of conflict with each other. But um, so I think, I think three is a great number to start with. And just, if you're having a hard time hitting the three, then keep focusing, then, then use the ease metric to, to guide you toward the easiest test to run. And um, you know, a lot of times we'll, I'll have uh there, there's one test that I've talked about in some of my presentations that was an email collector on Growth Hackers where we moved it from the bottom of the page to the top of the page, a really simple optimizely test to, to implement. The predicted impact for that test was only a four, but um, it literally took less, less than an hour to implement and it, uh, it ended up generating a 700% increase in emails collected. So um, the we, our predicted impact was way off. And that's, that's why I, I wouldn't use impact so much to guide you. I would use the goal of your tempo, te- your tempo, uh, of, of, if you can run three tests per week. Great. And then once you're hitting the three, then maybe you get more aggressive about, uh, you know, a few bigger tests mixed in, and then maybe you move it to four or five. And, you know, some, some companies run, you know, 30 tests per week. I know that was something that, uh, that the, uh, HubSpot sidekick team uh, was, was doing for quite a bit, but most of those tests were, were external channel tests. So hopefully that's, that's useful for you. Um, we're, we're already a little bit over. I appreciate everybody hanging in till the end here. And, uh, and um, I will provide, uh, we'll, we'll, we have all of your emails. So we'll send out the recording for the, uh, for the presentation as well as a link to the slides. So thank you everybody and have a great day.